Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Martha Macaluso, and I'm a myofunctional therapist and co-founder at Manhattan Myofunctional Therapy, LLC. And today, we will be doing part four of the importance of nasal breathing, and we will be focusing on asthma and obstructive sleep apnea with the world's leader in butacal breathing, Mr. Patrick McKeown. Patrick has published various books, including Sleep with Butaco, which is an excellent book. Um, it helps, um, it shows you how to stop snoring, sleep apnea, and insomnia. There's also many other books that he has written with his latest book titled The Oxygen Advantage, which is a must read book. It's an excellent book that talks about butaco breathing and some helpful exercises that you can do. And uh, Patrick, with uh, asthma being one of uh, the main concerns also in today's society, um, we are honored to have you here to speak to us about asthma and obstructive sleep apnea and the link between the two of them and how butaco breathing, which is a natural um, breathing re-education, uh, can help so many people out there. So I'm going to hand it off over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Marta. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there's a huge connection between sleep and asthma. Mm -hmm. um, many people with asthma, and I can talk from personal experience as well, um, during my teenage years into my early 20s, I was constantly tired. And it's very common for people with asthma to be tired. So, what's, so we need to ask the question, what's going on here? What, what are the links? And when we look at the literature between asthma and OSA, which is asthma and obstructive sleep apnea, there's approximately 74% of asthmatics experience nocturnal symptoms of airflow obstruction secondary to their reactive airways disease. So basically what it's saying is that three quarters of people with asthma, they have some difficulty breathing during their sleep and that it's, it's having some impact and it's going to have some impact on their quality of sleep. Whether it's upper airway resistance, that's reducing their breathing. It's, you know, it's not that they stop breathing, but it's their breathing volume is reduced or their flow is reduced or whether they're stopping their breath. Um, you know, it's going to have that impact. And if the sleep quality is affected, we're more likely to wake up tired. So it's not always about quantity and sleep. We also need to look at quality. And we need to look at what's the link between asthma and sleep apnea. What's the link between asthma and fatigue and asthma and airflow obstruction. So obstructive sleep apnea and asthma are highly prevalent respiratory disorders and they're frequently comorbid, so they occur together. Undiagnosed or inadequately treated OSA may adversely affect the control of asthma and vice versa. So this is a 2014 paper. So recently this is getting a little bit more attention than what it was, even though the link was always there. Um, but there seems to be, you know, more investigation into what's going on here. And that if you improve asthma control, can you also improve obstructive sleep apnea? Mm -hmm. Obstructive sleep apnea, hypopnea. So a hypopnea is a reduction in breathing flow um, by greater than 30% that continues over about 10 seconds or so. And that it's enough to decrease the oxygen desaturation. It's enough to drop oxygen desaturation by about between three and four percent depending on what you're looking at so in other words breathing flow has been reduced and an apnea is a complete cessation of breathing so obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea was significantly more prevalent among patients with severe compared with moderate asthma and more prevalent for both asthma groups than controls without asthma so when asthma severity increases people will tend to breathe harder because their airways are constricting. So to compensate for that, they breathe faster. Uh, they're probably taking stronger breaths in and out. And it's the stronger breathing that is possibly causing increased negative pressure in the upper airways, which is contributing to collapse. Because really our goal is with people with asthma and our goal with people with sleep disorder breathing is to teach them how to breathe through the nose and how to bring their breathing volume down towards normal levels. Because obstructive sleep apnea, it occurs when the negative pressure created during inspiration exceeds the dilating force of the upper airways, which would be basically the throat, uh, to stay open. So we're talking about let's reduce the negative pressure. And with asthma, as asthma severity increases, uh, does the negative pressure involved in breathing increase? 
and that's going to cause collapse. So let's look at changing breathing to bring down breathing volume towards normal, uh, to help open up the airways and reduce the negative pressure. And this again concurs with that is 88% of patients in severe asthma group, 58% of patients in the moderate asthma group, and 31% of patients in the controls without asthma had more than 15 apneic events per hour. So they had moderate obstructive sleep apnea. And again, a direct correlation, it seems, between asthma severity and the incidence of OSA. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that severe asthma increases, that OSA increases with severe asthma, it also increases with lack of asthma control. So there are two slightly different things. Asthma control is when the individual wouldn't be waking, waking up during their sleep because of their asthma. Or if they don't need, say, more than three puffs of Ventolin, their rescue medication per week. So if they're, for example, they take more than three puffs of their rescue medication per week, then their asthma is under poor control. So the whole objective is to get asthma under good control. And regardless of whether it's a mild a person with mild asthma, moderate asthma, or severe, the very fact that poor asthma control increases OSA, well, then we have to look at dysfunctional breathing patterns, which is prevalent in asthma and increases as asthma, as asthma control decreases. That is obviously having a link. So obstructive sleep apnea, we need to be teaching people functional breathing patterns to improve lung volume, to have diaphragmatic breathing, to have light breathing, and to breathe through the nose. And again, the prevalence between asthma and OSA ranges from 38% up to as high as 70%. Based on the current concepts of bidirectional relationships of OSA and asthma, it's sensible to assume that treating one disorder will result in the other's better control and vice versa. This is a 2016 paper. Now this really ties in with us because we have 16 clinical trials looking at how Buteco method helps with asthma. Mm -hmm. every clinical trial has been positive and this paper talks about a bi-directional relationship between the two so if we can help asthma can we help OSA and that's where we're trying to get it mm -hmm. and I think part of the reason that asthma severity as asthma severity increases OSA increases is the effect that asthma severity and symptoms have on reducing lung volume so the cross-sectional area of the upper airway increases when lung volume increases. Conversely, the airway is smaller and collapses more easily when lung volume is small. Now this is, would tie in as well with obesity. If you've got somebody who's very obese and they've got a lot of fat in around the belly area, it's difficult for the diaphragm to distend. So as a result then, lung volume is reducing. So if there's a small lung volume, it's going to increase the, the likelihood of the upper airway is collapsing. And if you think of somebody would ask me if they're having symptoms, their breathing is a little bit faster, it's generally through the mouth and its upper chest, smaller lung volume. Breathing through the nose has been documented to increase lung volume. It slows down breathing and it increases lung volume. So it could be the effect in lung volume that by improving asthma symptoms, by reducing asthma severity, lung volume is increasing, and by lung volume increasing, OSA is decreasing. Mm -hmm. So this relation probably exists because the, the lower and upper airways are mechanically linked. So that with increased lung volumes, it results in stiffening and dilation of the pharyngeal airway. So basically the lower airways is the thorax, the lungs, and the upper airway is, you're talking about basically the throat, um, the, the, no, the nasal cavity and the nose. Um, so the two are linked. Mm -hmm. And that brings us on. I'm going to continue on with asthma and rhinitis because this is part of our explanation mm -hmm. that it, it could also be, it's not just the poor lung volume and asthma that's contributing, but it's the fact that so many people with asthma also have rhinitis. Yes. That th this is the unified airway. The upper airway and the lower airway are one unified airway. If there's inflammation in one part, it can manifest in inflammation in the other. Mm -hmm. So inflammation in the nasal mucosa results in lower airway inflammation and vice versa. Inflammatory mediators and or infectious pathogens may also be transported along the respiratory mucosa or through the airways. And this is relatively new information. You know, we're talking about 2013. The previous paper, I think, was 2014. The one before that was 2016. So looking at the connection 
And I think it's a great step forward because I do believe that there's quite a relationship between there because this is what we've been working with for 15 years. We've seen it, but it's nice to see that it's, it's being documented. Mm-hmm. Nitric oxide and carbon dioxide may also act as eritrin messengers. Physiological, epidemiological, and clinical evidence supports that there's a unified airway model, that the, the nose, the nasal cavity, the upper airways is linked with the lower airways. And clinical studies indicate that the majority of patients with asthma have rhinitis. Now, at the very start, I think it was our first or second video, we looked at the relationship between nasal obstruction and snoring and nasal obstruction and rhinitis. And there's quite a significant link there. So here we're looking at the relationship between asthma and rhinitis. So people with asthma have a higher tendency towards rhinitis and there's quite a link between rhinitis and sleep disorder breathing. So it's almost as if it's a triangle. You've got asthma, you've got rhinitis, and you've got OSA. So one study showed that 100% of subjects with severe asthma and 77% of subjects with mild to moderate asthma had abnormal results on computed tomographic scans of the sinuses. So you see the link with rhinitis there. And that's where I think we're gonna leave it today. So we're looking at the effect of rhinitis, the effect of reduced lung function, and how that's contributing. And of course, asthma severity, how that's contributing to sleep disorder breathing. So let's get the nose open, let's bring down the breathing volume, and let's have a tendency towards more functional breathing and see the relationship between that and sleep disorder breathing. So I'm gonna pass it over back to you, Marta. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's always an honor to have you join us and uh, learn so much from you. And just make sure you stay tuned for our next session. We will be talking more about sleep disordered breathing in children. And uh, that concludes our session for today. Thank you.